to John chapter 14. Last week, uh, we began looking at a series titled, What About the End Times? What about the end times? The end times should not be a source of fear or trepidation or worry, but it should be a faithful expectation to the Lord's return and us ever being with him. 27% of the Bible is prophetic in nature. It is not yet to occur. It's eschatological. I'm going to say it wrong. Eschatology. Eschatological in nature, right? In other words, it's future events that have yet to happen or occur. I said that last week. I'm, I'm going to do my best not to repeat from last week. Uh, if you'd like to go to YouTube, uh, SLC Martinsville, you can find it. We spoke mainly about the doctrine of the rapture last week. Um, I'm going to try to move forward. And this week, part two is titled, Be Watching. Be Watching. But John chapter 14, and just a little bit of you, verses 1 through 3 says this, do not let your heart be troubled. He's getting ready to tell you some things that are going to happen. And the first thing he says is, don't be afraid. That's not a suggestion. That's a commandment. He's commanding us. Don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. I know what's coming. I am with you. I am before you. Don't be afraid. Like the words that Shri gave, his hand is outstretched. Always. Jesus does not recoil at you for any reason. I don't know. I feel like some of you have a picture that Jesus' hand can't be outstretched to me because of the pit that I'm in or the bondage that I'm in. or the, You don't know what I've done, Pastor. Look, whatever you've done, Jesus already died for it. He's extended his grace. He doesn't want you to do it again, by the way, because he knows the death it brings in your life. But he's already died for it. I just get the sense that somebody feels like the hand of the Lord will recoil any time you approach him. That's not true. That's a lie from the devil. His hand is outstretched. And he'll bring you right to the Father. That's the joy, one of the joys that we have as Christians. We can go back to our Father in heaven. No one else can approach God the Father. Except for those who go through Jesus Christ. It's a lie of the enemy to think that you can come to our Heavenly Father without going through Jesus first. It doesn't matter if they say they're praying to the God of the Bible. If they don't know Jesus, if not going through Jesus, if they're not completely relying upon the grace of Jesus Christ, His work, what He did on the cross, His shed blood, His death, His resurrection, and His ascension, they are not getting to God the Father no matter what the world says. Well, you're pretty narrow-minded, Pastor. I am. I'm about this thick in my mind. I wish it were so, but God, this is going to sound wrong, and you you could cut and crop this and say I'm a heretic. I understand that. Jesus is not inclusionary the way the world wants him to be inclusionary. He's inclusionary in this sense. He shed his blood. That was for everybody. He's exclusionary in this. The cross is offensive to people. He's not going to change it for them. The fact you have to go to the Father through Jesus excludes people. He's not going to change that fact for them. I believe the rapture is an exclusionary event. Not everybody is going. And he's not going to change that. Hell is extremely exclusionary. He's not going to go down to hell and give them a second chance, which is heretical doctrine being preached today. But he is exclusionary. He says that his grace has been manifest and appeared to all men. That's one of the verses. We'll get there. I'm so far ahead. Look, I'm on good pace, Amy, to get you out of here on time. (laughs) He says, John 14, 1. Look at how many read five words. Let's keep going. Do not let your heart be afraid. You believe in God. Believe in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, we sang about that today. Did you see this in the first song we sang today about let your faith? Oh, it's great words. And I was thinking as we were playing it, I'm like, oh, look at this. This is a, this is a, this is a rapture song. We didn't even know it. Let's see if I can find it real quick. I'm, I've never used a tablet to preach, but here we go. Uh, these things are like from 2001. It's ridiculous. Okay. It says this. It says, uh, let's see. I wonder if I can find this. You alone. Nope, that was the wrong spot. Uh, let our faith come out and the rise never fall. High above the valley, we declare... Your kingdom come. We will cling to what you've promised till the day you call us home. 
That could be the rapture. That could be when you die. Till the day that you call my, let our faith be the mountain that we stand on. It says we will cling to the promise. Let's look at the promise right here. It says in verse number um, two, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself that where I am, you may also be. Where I am, there are three promises here in verse number three. I will come again. I will receive you where I am, you will also be. That's a reason to shout. That's a reason to have joy in our heart. Jesus is saying, if I go, we know he went almost 2,000 years ago in the ascension. He's seated next to God the Father in heavenly places, and we are seated with him spiritually, not physically yet. He says, I will come again, and I will receive you, and you will ever be with me. That was in 1 Thessalonians 4 we talked about last week. I will ever be with the Lord. When he receives me, when this body drops Through death, or when his body is taken, through rapture, I will ever be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've read the Bible, there's some exciting times coming up. And they're victorious times for the Christian. Look, the future for Christianity is bright, full of hope and joy. Well, what if you're martyred? So what? Paul said very clearly, what can man do? Just take this body? Who cares? It's going to be resurrected. It's going to be resurrected. Does that mean it's painful in the time being? What is that moment of pain compared to eternity with Jesus Christ our Lord? I've told you, I, was, I've been read, I read the first, uh, a book on the first, it's a great book, called Tried by Fire by William J. Bennett. The first 1,000 years of Christianity, and there was people who were begging to be martyred because they knew the blessed hope of being with Jesus in that moment. And they were sick of the persecution. They were in jail, like, just martyr me. I'm ready to be with the Lord. And they were ready. And then one lady, I think I shared it already, she was pregnant, and she, they had a day coming up, for, and they weren't going to kill her if she was pregnant. But she was just pushing to have that baby early so she could be martyred. Now, that's maybe a little askew, but she knew the hope of being with the Lord Jesus and that her baby would be taken care of by the church. Now, it's a hard decision as a mother, but they had an understanding of the blessed hope that we, we've lost sight of. Why? Because it's been 2,000 years. And because it's been 2,000 years, there's doubters and, there's, and the Bible speaks of that. We know that God fulfills his prophetic promises starting with salvation in Genesis 3. He said that I will, you know, he's going to bring his Savior. There will be enmity between him and Satan, but he will crush his head, even though his heel will be bruised. That's prophetic. It's already happened. Jesus came. If you don't believe in prophetic, uh, the prophecies of the Bible, you don't believe in salvation. It's a prophetic doctrine that was already fulfilled, literally, So when I bring these scriptures to you, I'm looking at it from this point of view, literally. There was a big push a couple years, a couple years, a couple hundred years after Jesus died that changed all Bible prophecy to allegory and not literal. And it happened in Egypt, a place of great knowledge in Alexandria, Egypt. So in other words, heaven became not real, but became an idea. Hell was not real. It was an allegory of bad times. Well, guess what? That doctrine still exists today. It was was, uh, spoken about by a former Baptist minister. He said, hell is just what you go through on earth. It's not a real place. Well, that's not taking Bible prophecy literal. That's going back to the heretical doctrine in that time 2,000 years ago or 1,800 years ago. And... Christianity has fought and struggled to get back to little interpretations of Bible prophecy. So in other words, it was prophesied Jesus would come in Bethlehem, and he literally did. Right? Literally. It wasn't allegorical. He actually came. It's prophesied that he would die on a cross, and he literally did. So when we look at some of these end-time prophecies, that's the viewpoint that I'm looking, for, uh, looking at it from. And we're going to get into, I know I've, I've, I've had questions from my daughter mostly, and, and some from Kendall too. Or are you going to talk about the Antichrist? Are you going to talk about what it's going to be like you know, when the church is gone? Are you going to talk about... Some of these other things, yes, just not today. I mean, we've been doing this all summer. And I think it's important and it's necessary. Why? Because it should compel us to continue to go out. It should compel us to continually to live right. Right? It's not a source of fear. It's not a source of trepidation. It's knowing this. Jesus says, I will return. I will receive you. You will be with me. It's a promise of God. It will come to pass. And for that, we can have total faith. The fact that Bible prophecy is fulfilled is one of the reasons we know God is real. God is real. And the fact that 27% of the Bible is still dedicated to future events, we know that they're going to be fulfilled because God keeps his promises. 
Amen? That's the God that we serve. So we can rest knowing that my God knows what's coming, that he's going to keep his promises and fulfill them. 2 Timothy chapter 3. So let's look at some of the things that are prophesied in, in the end times, or what's going to happen. 2 Timothy chapter 3. So this first one, um, if you're taking notes, the title of this section is Signs of the Times. You and I, uh, brothers and sisters, Christians, we should be aware of the signs of the times. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and verse 8. This know also. So what does Paul want us to know? In the last days, perilous, savage, dangerous, fierce, troubled times, they, dangerous times, they are coming. For men shall be lovers of themselves. The word is simply selfish. In other words, they're putting yourself first in all things. Is that happening today? How many times have you been waved through an intersection lately? That's a little trivial example, but just think about that. I mean, you know, you ever been honked at because you just keep waving and people behind you are getting mad? No, that'd be rude to people behind you. But but just everybody's just about themselves. What can I gain from this situation? It says that he says men will be, they'll be covetous. That word means covetous for simply money. In other words, they're willing to kill and destroy for the gain of money. That's the word covetous here. Is that happening? Well, it's happened forever. Just for money's sake, just to make a buck, just to be rich. Well, my Bible says that it's, you know, it's hard for a rich man to get saved. When a rich young ruler came to Jesus, he told him to sell everything that he had. He couldn't do it. A lot of us are coming and we want things to do for the Lord, but are we willing to give up what he's asking us to get rid of in order to do those things for the Lord? The fear is we're going to lose something. That's the complete wrong mindset. What are you going to gain if you give it up? That's the correct mindset. You don't think the Lord can replace a few bucks? You don't think the Lord can replace a vehicle or some time that you gave away in order to serve him? Absolutely you can. That's our God. But we have to lay our lives down first. We don't want to be the covetous. We don't want to be uh, the selfish ones. It says that they will be boasters. They'll be blasphemers, which is haters of God. You know, when he talks about making a buck for money, do you remember this? They showed on Flashpoint, but I remembered uh, Robbie telling us about this, or we saw it before. When he was at January 6th, and he was talking to the people from Antifa, and he said they made $38 an hour to be there to riot. That's covetous. That's seeking money for destruction. $38 an hour. How many people here? Don't raise your hand. Make $38 an hour. It's pretty good money. I'm not going to go sign up for Antifa, though. But it's on camera. They said, yeah, we're Antifa. We get paid $30 an hour to, to be here in this weekend. It continues to say, uh, uh, Paul goes on. He says that they will be uh, proud. The word proud here means that they will despise others because they believe that they are better than them. Is that happening? Does the left despise the right because they think they're better than them? Does the right despise the left because they think they're better than them? Absolutely. Does one denomination look down on another denomination because they think they're better than them? Sadly, yes. This is in the church as well. I wish it wasn't, but it is. You know that denominations are completely unbiblical? Oh, maybe you don't know. Denominations are completely unbiblical. There's nothing about denominations in the church. There is one head of the church, Jesus Christ. Period. And he has a church, not a denomination here, denomination. You know, we're going to be really surprised in the rapture. And we all suddenly get up there and we're unified with Baptists or we're unified with these people across the world. We're like, oh, we're not going to be called that anymore. Jesus is going to say, okay, well, I prepared this dwelling place for you, Baptists. You go down the road that way. And I declare this dwelling place for you. You go down the road that way, whatever denomination you are. You know, that's not the case. But that's the way we think. And that's just insane because that's... The devil who has brought division and strife into the body. And now I couldn't even tell you how many denominations are, nor do I want to. We're just having the third largest Christian denomination split here coming up. And that's how we get more denominations. That's not God's intended will for the church. He goes on to say that there will be those who are disobedient to parents. Uh oh. You're in the Bible, children. Hey, don't worry, we were in the Bible, all your parents first before you were in the Bible. 
disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers. And I like this word. It says, or false accusers, this word is incontinent. And that word means they will have no self-control. If you watch the news, and I tell you, don't let your children watch the news. It's gross. I mean, there are elderly people being beaten in broad daylight, not even robbed. A 60-something-year-old man was, just died last week, five days after he was hit in the face for no reason. God just punched him and just walked on in New York City. No self-control. Brazen theft in the middle of the day, just going into Walgreens, filling up your bag, whatever you want, and then just walking right out. No self-control. Pushing people in front of trains. No self-control. And they've not found any personal agenda of why to do that. Why are they doing that? Because they're afflicted or possessed or oppressed or suppressed. Whatever the reason is, is evil behind it. If you go to San Francisco, people are just walking around in the middle of the San, in the San Francisco naked. If you go to New York City, Times Square, same thing, walking around naked. No laws anymore. All restraint is gone. The word in the Bible is lasciviousness. It's just take off all restraint. There's no self-control. It's this word here, incontinent. And it's, it's, you know, it's only getting worse. Big cities are becoming just cesspools of evil. And it starts with the governance of them, absolutely, yes, because it's been allowed to come in. So if you're called to go to that city to preach, okay, make sure, go, preach, be protected. But if you just want to go and visit that place, don't bring your children. What are you going to see? And it's sad. It's sad because there's Christians in these cities. And we need to pray for them. We need to support them. We need, we need, we need to not give up on these people in the cities. Because it's going to come to a city near you soon. Indianapolis has its own troubles. Martinsville has its own troubles. You and I as the church, knowing that the Lord's return, I believe can come at any moment. We've got to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. That's the only way. But that's the word incontinent. It's no self-control. It's lawlessness. There's no restraint. And then it goes down to, I said, they'll be traitors. It means they'll make a deal, but they won't ever keep that deal. They'll be heady which means they'll be rash and reckless. We think about the people in France and in Wisconsin and in the Middle East just driving cars into crowds. You're like, where's the hope? The hope is Jesus Christ. The hope is you and I in this world now to do something about it. That's the hope. That's the hope that we have. That's the encouragement we have. Verse 8, let's go ahead and go down there because I'm taking too long on some of these verses. Now, as, well, I, I got to go. I can't do that. Let's go back to verse 5. I can't. I, I just, it's dumb. It says now. I got to know what the now is for. It says they'll be high-minders, or high-minded. They'll be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. 53% of England denies or doesn't believe that there's a God. 53% of England. That's crazy. For of this sort are they which creep into houses... I'm sorry, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power of, the, of, of thereof, but some of those, it says turn away from those. They'll be in the church. It says turn away from them. That's a hard word. Paul's giving Timothy a hard word. Timothy has been set over a church. He's giving him instructions on how to lead that church. These are hard words. But if we allow it in the church and give voice and place to it, it'll poison. And it'll lead astray. And as a pastor in the church, or as a leader in the church, or as an elder in the church, we are to guard just like a father guards the home. And there's no place for it. There's no place for it. Verse 6, for of this sort are those who creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with different lusts, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Now as uh, Jane, I don't know, John's and Jambra's, as they stood against Moses, so do these, the ones he's talked about, verses 1 through 7, Resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. The word reprobate means casting away their faith. These people are casting away their faith. 
the common term right now, I don't know if you heard this, is deconstruction of their faith. There is a huge movement right now of Christian deconstructionists. And what that means is they go back to the basics. That's what they say. Ultimately, though, they tend to cast away their faith and reject Christianity altogether, Jesus, and God. These are deconstructionists. They renounce their faith. They renounce there's a heaven. They renounce there's a hell. Katy Perry, a deconstructionist, she said this in a quote. And her pastor was an even her dad is an evangelical pastor. She was raised in the church, sang in the choir, went to Nashville to record a gospel album, then went out to LA because she wanted to get in the entertainment industry. And there's a quote from her. She says, Don't believe anymore in heaven or hell or an old man sitting on a throne. This is a deconstructionist when they finally get to the very end of taking their faith away. Now, again, I'm not saying that to judge Katy Perry. Pray for her. Pray for her. If he's a man of faith, he's believing in him, and his household shall be saved. Join his prayers of the Father. Kevin Max, he was the third part of DC Talk you never knew about. He calls himself, and this is a popular term these days, ex-evangelical instead of evangelical. He's an ex-evangelical. He believes now in the universal Christ. There isn't one. There's not a universal Christ. It's not the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus of the Bible. Cademan's call. Their lead guitarist walked away from their faith. They can go on and on and on. There's so many Christian music artists who have walked away from their faith. And there's even pastors that have done so as well. Uh, and it's just sad. But the Bible prophesied it. We shouldn't be unaware, we should understand that the Bible has prophesied it. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, uh, Peter says this about the last days. He says, knowing this first, that's a strong exhortation, know this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Paul just talked about to Timothy. This is an echo of what Paul just talked about. And they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep when they died, all things have continued as they were from the very beginning of creation. So in other words, why should we believe that Jesus is returning? These are scoffers. If you meet one of these, what you should do is walk up to them and shake their hand and say, you're in the Bible. The Bible speaks about you. You're a scoffer. But he is returning. You know what? This doctrine right here, the Lord can turn at any moment, and since he hasn't for 2,000 years, is one of the main reasons deconstructionists walk away from the faith. Because they believe the church has lied to them and they have no answer of why Jesus hasn't returned. When the answer is very simple. He's full of grace and mercy. He says he's that he wishes none should perish. It says he's not slack in fulfilling his promises. He's not slack. He's not wasting time up there. He's interceding for you and I. He's strengthening, extending grace to you and I to do what he's called us to do. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. John says this. This is our third witness. Little children, it is the last hour that word is translated. And he's got a passion saying this. But remember, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to say it. It is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last hour. Antichrist, th these are people, they, they are putting themselves in place of Jesus. They're preaching false religions. And every false religion comes down to this crux. Jesus is not God. That's it. I love Robbie Dawkins' new shirt that he wears, or that he wears out in the Middle East, too, and, and real big, and in Arabic so, they can read, Arabic so they can read it. It says, Jesus is God. That's blasphemy in their culture. He could be killed on the spot for that, but he wears it anyway, because that is the point of contention. Jehovah's Witness, they don't believe Jesus is God. Mormons, they don't believe Jesus is God. He is God, and he is man. Well, how does that work, Pastor? The Bible says he is God, and he is man. Well, no, explain it to me. He's God, and he's man. I don't have to defend God. We or you and I are not called to defend God or defend God's word. We're not. We're called to preach the truth, to proclaim the good news. What is the good news? Jesus Christ died so you can be redeemed from sin, and he's returning for you. So in the meantime, because we love him, we go and do the good works he created for us to do. 
That's the good news. That's the gospel. We have a hope. Jesus is coming and I will be with him. If I die before he comes back, I will be with him. And one day then my resurrected body will join me in the air. That'll be a great day. It'll be awesome. Imagine that view. Last week I talked about if I was walking through a cemetery when it happened and all of a sudden, you know, shooting around every side. It's like, oh, wow. Ooh, then I'm gone. It doesn't matter. But imagine the view up top when you see your resurrected body coming to you. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. I think that's it. Well, boom, and then, you know, and it's glorified, and, it's, and now it's immortal, and now it's imperishable. Now it can't be corrupted again. Now it's never going to die again. Now it belongs to Jesus completely. I mean, that's an awesome day. This is our hope. This is our encouragement. It's not a sad message. This is what we as Christians should be excited about. In Mark chapter 13, he tells the parable of the fig tree. Why? Because we should be able to discern on the fig tree when the fruit is coming. We, you and I as Christians, should be able to see the times and be able to discern them. And we see, uh, you know, the, the riots of, of white supremacists or, or, or BLM. It doesn't matter. Pro-life vandalism or pro life used to do bombings at abortion clinics. All this lawlessness. It doesn't matter what you think your cause is. It's prophesied and we, you and I are to be encouraged because the Bible says he's coming. We're not to panic. We're to be ready. We're to discern the times. Think about this. When you walk into... Walmart or one of these big box stars like Menards and it's, I don't know, early September and you see Christmas trees and Christmas decorations up. What do you know is coming? Well, Thanksgiving, but yeah, or, or Halloween, <laughs> right? But yeah, Christmas is coming. We can discern the times. It's getting near the Christmas season. They just skip a few holidays, but that's okay, right? But but that's, a, that's what this parable is saying. You and I should be able to discern the times. We should be able to see and know that what is coming. And in that moment now that we see such lawlessness, I've never seen in my lifetimes. And I understand back in Oakland, and, you know, in the, in the Rodney Key, I understand that. That was horrible. But this is worse. This is longer lasting. And believe you me, there's going to be some upset and there's going to be some issues and some destruction, hopefully no loss of life, when the decision is made on Roe v. Wade. Lawlessness is going to continue to abound. We have people set in place who refuse to uphold the law when it's their very job to do so. Right now, we have rioters and protesters outside of a federal judges. That is a law on the books not being upheld. They're allowed to do it. Just Turning our heads aside, blind to the law. Same thing with the border. It is illegal, illegal to cross into the United States without going through a port of entry and declaring. But we're not upholding those laws. The law doesn't matter to Satan, never has, never will. I wasn't calling any person Satan, by the way. I'm just saying it's his spirit behind these things. You and I believe that he can come back at any time doesn't mean that we grab a tinfoil hat and go up on a roof and just hum until he returns. That's not what it means. You laugh. This happened. I think it was in the 80s. People were told by pastors to go give all their belongings to the poor and needy because Jesus was returning. Guess what? If they said he's returning next week, he's not returning next week. And the Bible says nobody knows. But it happened. We're not to live that way. That's crazy. You want to get made fun of even more for the wrong reasons being in the church? That's how you do it. So we're not going to do that. We're not quitting school, children. We're not quitting our jobs. We're not abandoning family planning. We need bigger families of Christians. Bigger families with the word of God being read at their home and being expounded on at their home. Amen. By fathers, by mothers. Because he could come back today, it's just set a fire in us to get involved. I like this quote. The guy's name was Dr. Summers. He says this. The fact that the glorified son of God could step through the door of heaven at any moment is intended by God to be the most pressing, incessant motivation for holy living and aggressive ministry. And it is the greatest cure for apathy. It should make a major difference in every Christian's values, actions, priorities, and goals. I like the way he said that. It should make a difference to you and I. Aggressive ministry and holy living. Amen. Next section here. We are delivered from wrath. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Turn there with me. Oh, I got seven minutes. We got this. Where's Amy? Don't tell Amy. Where's she at? Oh, okay. I'm working on it. You won't be late. Kendall drives fast. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Oh, I want to go through this. It's okay. You and I are delivered from the wrath to come. We're not going to make it. It's okay. This is a series. 
That's not me. Is it me? I got a new cord. Sorry. I'm going to put my shirt that way. Sorry. It was me. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll, we'll wrap up with this, with this section of verse. It says, but other times and seasons, brothers, I don't need to write to you. In other words, the church of Thessaloniki or Niki, whatever, Paul is saying you already are discerning the times. Paul is saying you are already aware and watching what's going on. That's what he's saying here in verse 1. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And a lot of Christians stop there and they say that. Well, we don't know. The Lord comes as a thief in the night. Uh-uh. Hold that thought. If that's your thought, don't say it out loud because I'm going to correct that here in a minute. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail on a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, you are not in darkness. You, uh, that that day should come on, on you as a thief you are all the children of the light and then the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others. Let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, they sleep at night. And they that get drunk, get drunk in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on a breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. A couple things to break down here in verse number three. When Paul says this, for when they shall say. You and I are not the they in this verse. Do we understand that? There's two people here. We, Christians and Paul, and the they, everybody else. You and I are not the they in this verse. They, the world, is saying peace and safety. This has a connotation of assumption. They are assuming, wishing for peace and safety. It's a false peace and safety. It's like when our president gets up and he stands and looks right in front of the camera and he goes, our economy is strong. <laughs> Last month, due to inflation, all of us spent four to $700 more. And it's only getting worse. But he says our economy is strong. He might whisper it. <laughs> Sorry. But he's wishing that to be the case. He's just hoping it'll be the way. You can say it all you want. It's not going to be true at this moment in time. I'm not suggesting you do this, but all of my retirement is in the stock market. I haven't looked at the numbers. When the stock market drops 10,000 points, it's not gone up. I can just tell you that much. So this is, but this is the connotation of what they're saying in peace and safety. It comes upon them. And they shall not escape. When it says they shall not escape, by implication, with using basic logic, there are people who will escape. That's the church. That's Christians. That be, that's believers. In verse 4, he says, but you. Now he's talking to Christians in contrast with the they and with the them that he's been talking about. In verse number 4. Does everybody see that? So now Paul changes. He says, but you, brethren, you're not in darkness like they are. You're not in drunkenness like they are. You're not asleep like they are. He says, let us not sleep. That word means be unaware of the times and seasons. It means a spiritual slumber. But let us watch. That means be vigilant. Take heed and let some calamity overtake you. You and I are to watch so calamity doesn't overtake us. You and I are to be sober. That means to be calm in spirit. Not running around like Chicken Little saying, the sky's falling. That's not to be us. We are to watch and be sober. And in verse 9, why are we watching and be sober? Paul says this in verse 9, because God has not appointed you and I to wrath. That word wrath is the same meaning as the word wrath used in the Old Testament in Hebrew. That means indignation. Indignation is anger that is expressed as a form of punishment. God's wrath is punishment upon a Christ-rejecting world. God's wrath is not upon his children because they didn't reject Christ. So when he says you've been a way of salvation, you're not appointed to God's wrath. Why? Because you're his children. He's not punishing his children in this verse with this connotation. He's punishing the they, those who are asleep, those who are, are, are in darkness, those who uh, uh, you know, are in drunkenness, those who are in the world. That's what... He's saying, we, you and I are not appointed to God's judgment in this sense. 
Paul is saying those who know, those who discern the times and seasons, Christians, that's what he's saying, will not be appointed to wrath. Others, whether they claim to be a Christian or not, that's irrelevant. Not everybody says they're a Christian is a Christian, right? We know that already. I hope so. But they walk in darkness. They live in darkness. They want peace and safety at any cost. They pay no allegiance to Christ. They only please their self. And on them, on the they in these verses, that day comes the thief in the night. If somebody comes up to you and says, well, you know, Christian, it comes as a thief at night. It may be true for you. It's not true for me. I'm watching. I'm sober. I'm expecting. We're not going to get to expecting uh, today. We're going to wrap it up right here. Here's, here's what the world is looking for. This is a quote. The Lord is not coming as thieves to you and me, but to those who are in darkness. This is a quote from the Belgian prime minister when the European Union was set up. This is what he said. And you should see that this is fulfilling biblical prophecy to come. The Belgian principal or uh, prime minister who set up the European Union said this, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. What's the motivation? Money. And then he says this, send us such a man. And be he God or devil, we will receive him. That's how the European Union was set up. He was the principal architect of it. That's a fulfillment towards a biblical prophecy.